Now, when it comes to evangelism, getting people saved, I believe the church has missed a key ingredient to reaching the lost. Let me put it this way. I'm going to show it to you from the Word of God. The church will never be 100% effective in reaching the lost until the church embraces the ministry of deliverance. Say that again. The church will not be 100% effective in reaching the lost until we embrace the ministry of deliverance. So I want you to get a revelation of deliverance. Deliverance is more than you as a believer coming and getting delivered from demons and, and going home full of the joy of the Lord. Deliverance is a key ingredient. It is a key. Jesus told Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. God wants to give us keys. Deliverance is one of those keys. And if you don't get this key, you will not be as successful in reaching the lost as you would if you used the key. The fact is that most churches are turned off by the ministry of deliverance. Many pastors simply believe that we don't have place for that in our church because it would actually hinder us from reaching people. But the way of God is so different from the way of man. You know, we, we, we come up with this now. This is the, the, the move of the church. And if you're studying church growth now, I do a lot of reading on church growth. I, I try to find out why churches grow and why they don't grow. Anytime a church is not growing, there's a reason for it. The spirit realm is not just some haphazard realm with demons and angels flying everywhere and bumping into each other and in traffic jams with no rules and regulations. There are spiritual laws and spiritual principles, uh, even though it is spiritual, and there are reasons why things happen and reasons why they don't happen. And today the common phrase is churches are called user-friendly, seeker-sensitive. That's the pattern of church growth. In other words, churches, uh, now they're teaching that if you, you want your church to grow, you want to reach more people, then number one, you, you, you shorten your services. You don't really preach strong messages because certain people will not come to your church if your message is too strong. And so you just kind of preach a nice gospel and don't offend anybody. And make sure your church is user-friendly and seeker-sensitive. In other words, we're very sensitive to the people that are seeking God. We don't want to offend them. We are seeker-sensitive. We don't want to offend anybody. So we don't, you know, we don't really get into the, we don't really give them too much. I mean, as far as prophesying and in worship and lifting your hands and shouting and dancing and casting out devils and laying hands on the sick and people falling out. That, that may be a little bit too much for those who are seeking and we're seeker sensitive. That's not the way of God. When Jesus preached in the book of Mark, he wasn't preaching a seeker sensitive gospel. Brother, he was casting out devils and healing the sick and raising the dead. And the result was that multitudes followed him. Why? Well, because we're trying to be seeker sensitive. We're trying not to offend anybody who may not understand what we're doing. But deep down inside of the hearts of people, people are empty and they're looking for the power of God. They've tried yoga, they've tried the psychic line, they've tried everything, and when they come to our church, we may think that if we just get too strong in the Holy Ghost, it's going to turn them off, but that's exactly what people are yearning for, they're thirsty, and Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, and this he spoke of the Holy Ghost. People are looking for the fullness of the Holy Ghost. So we think we offend folk when, and some folk, they're going to mock and laugh 
But I'm telling you, when, when, when the power of God hits the place and people fall out and devils come out, that's exactly what some folk want. They're looking for the reality. You may think it's going to offend them and they're going to get their coat and, and leave the church, but that's exactly what they're looking for. And then when you say, how many want Jesus? Uh, they'll break their leg getting down that aisle uh, because they're looking for the power of God. So we don't have to be seeker sensitive. God's ways are not our ways. Jesus said, blessed is he who's not offended in me. <laughs> Go and tell John what you see. John the Baptist sent messengers to Jesus to say, are you the one or do we look for another to come? And he said, you go tell John. He was in prison. Go tell him that, that the sick are healed, that the deaf hear, that the blind see, that the dead are raised, and that miracles are taking place. And blessed is he who was not offended in me. <laughs> that means you don't stumble over deliverance and miracles healings and devils screaming out. That, that don't offend you. It may offend somebody, but you'll be blessed if you're not offended in Jesus. But let me read the scripture here. I'm going to show you the deliverance is the missing ingredient. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. As I said, that's the spirit that possesses most churches, blind and dumb. The good prophetic word. God wants to deliver us from a deaf and dumb spirit. And he healed them in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, uh, uh, This fellow, look how they call him, this fella, this dude, this cat, I don't know where he came from, this fella. He certainly didn't go to our schools. He's definitely not licensed by us. This fella does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto him, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can it, shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Verse 29. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Then verse 30 is the verse I want to emphasize tonight. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Now, what is the whole purpose of evangelism? The whole purpose of evangelism is to gather people into the kingdom of God. Gather them. They're lost. They're wandering. They need to be gathered. Notice that Jesus ties in gathering with the ministry of deliverance. He that is not with me in this particular ministry of deliverance, because the whole context of the verses is referring to the controversy about them accusing him of casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And then he says, he that is not with me, he's saying either you're with me in this deliverance ministry or you're against me. If you're with me, you're gathering. If you're against me, you're scattering. You see, most teaching on evangelism does not include the ministry of deliverance. We go to evangelistic meetings and we'll talk about soul winning and how to witness and we'll share with people how to take them on the Roman road, which is good. Which scriptures to share with the lost. How to witness. How to deal with certain kinds of people. But there is no substitute for the power of God. And very seldom do we tie in evangelism with deliverance. Now, in studying church growth, uh, several years ago I began to uh, study the subject of church growth, and that's why I learned about churches talking about their user-friendly, seeker-sensitive. And... 
Recently, one of the greatest revivals in the world has been taking place in South America, especially in the nation of Argentina. Tremendous revival. There are churches now, we're talking about the power of gathering. There are churches now in Chile and in Argentina. It is not uncommon to find a church over 100,000 members within the past several years springing up. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in Santiago, Chile, there is a church, and I've said this before, that is close to 300,000 members. In, in some parts of Brazil, there are churches. It is not common to find churches of 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people because of the revival that has taken place. Now, in studying uh, the, the ones who are preaching in these revivals, there is a South American evangelist, and I've shared with you about him. His name is Carlos Anacondia. He's a South American evangelist that God has raised up. We don't know very much about him in the States because he primarily preaches to the Spanish-speaking nations. And this man has one of the most effective uh, ministries of evangelism the world has ever seen. Now, we know that in studying evangelism, some of your greatest evangelists recently have been Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists that, that, that this world has known. And, of course, recently in Africa, Reinhard Bonnke has been used by God to touch the lives of millions of Africans. But in studying the, the three ministries, uh, Peter Wagner, who's the author of this book, has concluded that Carlos Anacondia's ministry today is probably the most successful evangelistic ministry in the world today, even comparing, comparing his ministry with Billy Graham and Reinhard Bonnke. It is said that his converts have more of a rate of staying with the church than any other evangelist. That means that the people who do get saved in his meetings have a higher percentage of staying with the church than any other evangelist in modern history. Because we know that when you have mass crusades, you may have, have 5,000 people come and, and say the sinner's prayer, but after two or three months, how many of them are still serving God? Now, there's something unique about his ministry. And the unique thing about Carlos Anacondia's ministry is the ministry of deliverance. His ministry has had such dramatic manifestations of deliverance until when he goes into a city and he preaches the gospel to hundreds, sometimes up to 100,000 people at one time. As he preaches, what he does is he will challenge the powers of darkness in that meeting and command them to manifest. And all over the tent, people start screaming and demons start manifesting and people start getting deliverance. I mean, there's just deliverance begins to break out. He begins to challenge the powers of darkness in that city. He begins to come against them in the name of Jesus. He begins to command them to come out to, and all of a sudden people start screaming and manifesting in his, in his, in his particular revival meetings and, and they begin to cast out devils. He has some of the most dramatic manifestations of demons of any evangelist, uh, but his ministry is so effective because after that is done uh, and when the altar call is given for salvation thousands of people come to the altar and give their life to Jesus and he has the highest percentage of people once they get saved uh, going into the church and staying in the church than any other evangelist in modern history <laughs> they're not going to teach you that in seminary when it comes to evangelism because it doesn't make sense. We don't want demons crying out of people. We don't want manifestations because we think that that's going to turn people away. But I'm telling you what it does. When you begin to cast out devils, uh, it breaks the power of devils. Uh, and if you think about it, the only thing that is keeping people from getting saved is the devil in the first place. Most of us are familiar with the verse of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 4, 3. Don't turn there. It says, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, uh, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ should shine unto them. You see, breaking the power of the devil is the key to causing people's eyes to be opened so they can see the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the Lord says, concerning his ministry of deliverance, God says it's a gathering ministry. It gathers people. 
You see, God did not give us the ministry of deliverance thing so we can just cast devils out of each other. God does want us to get free, but God has given us the ministry of deliverance to break the powers of darkness off of this city and off of, uh, of where we minister so that people can be free to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and give their hearts to Jesus. That's why I call deliverance the missing ingredient in evangelism because even most of your evangelicals, your Charles Swindolls, and your MacArthur's, oh, they're so evangelical, they're so nice, and they have good ministries. They come on uh, one or whatever, whatever the station is, and they teach, and, they, and they call themselves evangelical because they're evangelistic. They want to reach the world, and, and many times they reach a lot of people, but I'm telling you something. There's some people you're not going to reach by just giving them a, a five-point uh, salvation plan. There's some people you're not going to reach by putting a track in their hand. Oh, tracks are fine, and many have gotten saved with tracks, uh, but we think if we can just get enough tracks and learn all the scriptures on salvation and stand uh, on the street corners and argue with people about whether or not Jesus is the Son of God, uh, we think that that's going to save uh, people. But the Bible says uh, it's not by might, uh, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. God is bringing us back to the raw power of the Holy Ghost. We're not ashamed to cast out devils. We're not ashamed to flow in the power of God. We're not ashamed to preach the whole gospel. We're not ashamed of demonic manifestations because we know that once the power of demons is broken over a city and demons begin to be cast out, what did Jesus say when they came back? They said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. He said, Rejoice not that the devils are subject unto you, but rejoice rather that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then he says something very important. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. You see, when you cast devils out of people on the ground, the things in heaven begin to fall. The powers of darkness begin to fall. And God, that city begins to be opened up for the glory of God to flow in. But we're trying to go into a city where the powers of darkness have ruled for generations. And we're trying to get the devils out by tracks. Jesus did not say in my name they'll track out devils. He said in my name they'll cast out devils. You can't track them out. You can't argue them out. You got to cast them out. So even many of your evangelicals who don't believe in the power of the Holy Ghost and don't believe that tongues are for the day and deliverance is for the day. And they, they have these evangelical schools where they teach you the doctrine of salvation. And they teach you how to take people on the Roman road. I mean, most people, if you've been in the Baptist church, they'll tell you about the Roman road. But the only problem is until you get some folk delivered, they ain't going to get on that road. They're trying to get on the Roman road, but they got devils that are holding them back. Uh, and you saying, come on the Roman road. And they're saying, brother, I'm trying, but there's something that's holding me back. Uh, and the Lord says, if you want to get them on the Roman road, some folk, you got to cast the devil out of them uh, before they get on the road to salvation. Turn to Luke chapter 11. You see it said again. Which are my gathering. We're talking about getting people to get saved and get them in the church. Deliverance. See, we always, we, we thought the old folk are not going to come to us because we're in deliverance. That's exactly why they're going to come. Verse 22. Well, let's begin in Luke chapter 11 and verse 20. Notice the words of Jesus. It said, but if I cast, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. See, as long as the devil is armed, he, his goods are in peace. When the devil is armed, he's a strong man of that city. He's not worried about you with your tracks. You can come in with 50-pound Bibles and tracks all day. You can come in with your little books, the, folk, uh, the steps of, to Christ, the, uh, the five-step salvation plan. You can have all your evangelicals with you. You can have on your Jesus buttons. You can have Try Jesus bumper stickers on your car. 
But as long as the strong man is armed, the Bible says his goods in peace. Devil's in peace. He's not worried about you. Brother, when you come, he just says, I'll go take a nap. Wake me up when they finish. I mean, you got your little, you got your soul winning teams and you've been to the first evangelical church and you've learned how to lead people through the sinner's prayer and how to confess the Lord Jesus according to Romans chapter 10. I mean, you know all the scriptures on salvation, but as long as the strong man is armed, his good's in peace. <laughs> he's not worried about you. He, 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 his thing, his kingdom is together. He's got folk bound. He's in peace. But notice this. Now remember, Jesus is talking about casting out devils because he said, if I by the Spirit of God cast out devils, then he said, verse 22, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. The only thing the devil worries about is when somebody shows up who's stronger than him, who knows the power of the name of Jesus and ought to cast out devils and he strips him of his armor and he goes in there and he plunders his kingdom. That's what the devil fears. <laughs> then he says the same thing in verse 23. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. And he's talking about deliverance because right there in verse 24, he says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. So right in the context of deliverance, the Lord uses the word gathereth. Gathereth. In other words, what the Lord is saying, you're not going to do much gathering without casting out devils. That's why Carlos Anacondia's ministry has been had such dramatic results in South America. It's amazing. This man was raised up by God. He was not even a preacher. He was just a, a lay person, and God raised him up, and now he's preaching all over the world, South America, in his crusades. Thousands get saved. There are churches that are exploding in Argentina, 50, 60, 70, 100,000 people. I mean, they're gathering those kinds of numbers together in one church after a few years. But why is it so difficult in America to get a church of over 1,000? One of the reasons why is because we have neglected the ministry of deliverance. We have thought that, oh, nobody wants that, that, that manifestation. All that does is drive people away. And the devil has fed the church a lie saying, don't get involved in that deliverance because no one is going to come to your church. But the Lord says the opposite. He says, if you are with me and you cast out devils, you're going to gather. That's why I call deliverance the missing ingredient of evangelists. Every evangelist needs to learn how to cast out devils. You call yourself an evangelist, you'll never be successful in gathering people into the harvest until you learn how to cast out devils. Now we see this in Acts chapter 8. Turn there quickly. We see it in the ministry of, of Philip. Now this is interesting. I want you to see this because we're talking about evangelism. We're talking about reaping the harvest. Acts chapter 8. And listen to me very carefully. Beginning in verse 5. Philip, and you may want to write these verses down I'm going to give you just to bag up what I'm saying today. Philip is the only person in the New Testament that is called an evangelist. And we know there are more in the early church, but if you write down Acts chapter 21, verse 8. As a matter of fact, let's turn there first. Acts 21, 8. Now, Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, but he didn't call him an evangelist. How many know you can do the work of an evangelist without being an evangelist? The work of an evangelist is just getting people saved. All of us can do that. It's like all of us can prophesy, but all of us are not prophets. As a matter of fact, the word evangelist, and this is interesting because often I, I, I've asked the Lord, why is it that you don't put more in the Bible concerning certain things? And the Lord told me everything you need is in there. Everything you need is already in there. God didn't leave anything out. In other words, the reason why they're, they're not more is because you don't need any more. The Bible says if everything that Jesus did was written, 
the world would not have enough books to contain it. The word evangelist is only found three times in the Bible. You may want to write these verses down. It's found, of course, in Ephesians chapter 4, where it's called for the perfecting of the saints. The word evangelist, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. That's Ephesians 4, 11. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, where it says, do the work of an evangelist. Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, which is to win the lost. And it's found in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, only three times. Look at this. The next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea and entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, or one of the seven deacons that was ordained in Acts chapter 6. So I don't care what folks ordain you as. If somebody ordained you as a deacon, if you are really an evangelist, your true gift going to come out. So don't worry about, you know, where they made me an advantage. Your true gift. A man's gift will make room for him. So don't worry about somebody say you make you an advantage, a, a deacon. Well, I'm an apostle. It'll come for it. Came out of Philip. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Now, he, he, he's the only person in the New Testament that is called an evangelist. And when I was studying on the subject of the evangelist, I said, Lord, why didn't you put more in here? I, I need more scriptures on evangelism. I want to write a book, and I don't have enough. I've only got three verses. Lord, what can I do with three verses? Lord said, if you just pray, I'll reveal to you about evangelism. Lord said, there's more in there than you think. I mean, sometimes you can read a verse and think there's nothing in there, and until God opens it up, it's so much in that one verse, you can preach five years out of that one verse. Look at verse 5. Then Philip, he's called an evangelist in Acts 21, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Look at this now. And the people with one accord gave heed, or they listened, unto those things which Philip spake. Now, why did people listen to Philip? Here it is. Underline this. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Some folk not going to pay attention to you without any miracles. You can have a truckload of tracks. Look at verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice. Ah! That's a loud voice. Isn't that what the Bible say? Loud voice? <laughs> I mean, when Philip went down there, he's in the van, he starts preaching and teaching. I mean, he starts preaching Jesus. All of a sudden, devils start screaming out of people. <laughs> See, we left that out. <laughs> We're trying to gather folk without that. We don't want that. We don't, by no means in our church, we can't have anybody screaming out. They scream out, take them to the side room. Because we're trying to get people saved and that may distract people. No, that's what's going to get them saved. When the powers of darkness are broken, folk, all of a sudden that thing that was holding them back from accepting Jesus is broken off of them. And you say, how many want to be saved? They'll rush to the altar. And say, what must I do to be saved? Verse 7, for many, un for unclean spirits, cry crying with loud voice came out of a few. Many. That were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Notice that deliverance opens the way for healing to take place. 
That's another thing God's going to teach us, something about healing. We're trying to get folk healed without casting devils out. I'm going to say the main thing that's keeping them sick and lame is the devil. And once the devil leaves, all of a sudden they can walk again. All of a sudden they get healed because you're breaking the power of the devil off of them. Oh, most churches, they'll deal with healing. They'll line them up and lay hands on them and tap them and they fall gently and the ushers catch them and they get back up and when, when they get up they're still limping off the stage and we're saying take it by faith brother and, and brother he's buckling and, and limping and <laughs> deal with the devil See, people always accuse us, deliverance folks, of putting too much of an emphasis on deliverance. Uh, but I'm telling you, once you get the revelation of deliverance, uh, you understand uh, that this thing is so important uh, until we cannot neglect it if we're going to reach the lost uh, and heal the sick. We tried to save the lost and heal the sick without dealing with the devils. <laughs> See, evangelicals, they love getting people saved. Charismatics love getting them healed. But you can't get them saved or healed without dealing with demons. So deliverance, folks, we like getting devils out and getting them saved and getting them healed. We like getting them completely free by the power of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Verse 8, there was great joy in that city. How I many you know when deliverance comes, joy comes? When revival comes, joy comes. Uh, there wasn't just one person with joy after he began to cast out devils uh, and after people got saved uh, and healed, uh, the spirit of joy came into the city. God wants to bring revival to America. He wants to bring some joy back to America. But God is saying uh, you cannot sidestep deliverance. We're trying to go all around it and under it. Ignore it and cut around it and scoot by it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to teach it. We don't want to challenge the devil. I'm talking about full gospel. Uh, of course, I don't expect the evangelicals to, to want it because they don't even believe that the Holy Ghost is for the day. They even fight the uh, speaking in tongues and the baptism. So I understand uh, them. They don't just don't believe in the power of God, uh, and yet they want to reach the world for Jesus. Uh, but what shocks me are the tongue-talking Pentecostal folks uh, who are sitting in churches. Uh, they're trying to sidestep deliverance too. And Jesus said, you can't do it. You can't do it. You got to eat the whole roll. You can't take out some and expect it to work. It's like baking a cake, brother. If you don't put the baking soda in there, you're going to have a flat cake. It's not going to rise. And we're trying to do it without the proper ingredients. And God is saying the only way you're going to get Bible results, you got to put everything in it that belongs in it. Let me conclude here. But since this is the only reference, since Philip is the only reference in the New Testament to the ministry of an evangelist, only time is mentioned, a person that's called an evangelist, Acts 21, 8, Philip. And then it gives, the only record it gives of his ministry here is in Acts chapter 8. What God is showing us is in that, those few verses of Scripture, the thing that God emphasized are two things. Number one, he preached Christ. Number two, he cast out demons. So the Lord is saying, not only must you preach Jesus, you must also cast devils out. Because if you just preach Jesus without casting out devils, some people can't respond to the gospel message because they're too bound by demons. They want to respond. They know they need salvation. But it's something that holds them back. Witchcraft holds them back. Powers of devils holds them back. You find in the book of Acts chapter 8 that there was a sorcerer in that city called Simon who controlled that city. Some uh, churches and some nations are completely controlled by the powers of witchcraft. 
Listen, you can preach all day to folks who are bound in witchcraft, uh, and they'll hear your message, uh, but it'll never penetrate, uh, because there's something about witchcraft uh, that keeps people bound, uh, but once you break the power of witchcraft, uh, and once you cast out the devils, uh, all of a sudden, uh, they're free to accept Jesus Christ, uh, and they end up being the best Christians. I'm not talking about these crusades where few, uh, uh, we had 10,000 decisions for Christ. And then five months later, four of them left. That's not gathering. That's just some decisions. We love to give these inflated numbers. But God is saying, how many get in the church and stay in the church? Gathering. The church is a gathering. We're gathered together. God gathers his people together in one body. Now the fact is not how many decisions you made, not how many cars were filled out, not how many books you gave them, and then five months up the road, they're right back in sin. The Bible wants us to gather them. He wants us to bring them into the church because Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And we're having other nations, especially in South America, where there's tremendous revival and churches are being raised up uh, of 100, 200,000 people. Uh, and in America, we're, getting, we're fighting over five folks. If two people leave your church, you get mad at the pastor that they went to. We're fighting over two and three folks. Uh, we're getting mad because we're trying to hold on to the 20 and 30 folk that we have. Uh, and But God is saying, listen, uh, I got such a harvest out there. I got millions of people out there. I want to gather them unto you. I don't want to just bless you with 10, 20, 30, even 100 folk. God said, I want to send multitudes unto you. But in order to gather them, uh, you cannot be against the ministry of deliverance. Uh, because if you're against me, instead of gathering, you're going to scatter people. Chicago is full of folks that are scattering folks. You got preachers in this city think they're getting folk together. All they're doing is fighting deliverance and scattering folks. Uh, but God's going to raise up some deliverance preachers uh, that are not afraid to cast out devils. Uh, not afraid because they're gonna, God's going to gather his people together. And you can fight deliverance all you want to. You can talk about it on your little tired radio program all you want to. But God is saying, uh, I'm going to gather my people from the north and the south and the east and the west. Uh, and if you don't get your ministry together, you will not be a part of what I'm going to to do in this hour oh yeah those unbelievers they may look bug-eyed but I tell you make the altar call and watch them come say brother that's not good church growth principles we've got to be seeker sensitive and user friendly When they come, we must smile. We must have on our white gloves. We must not do anything to offend the first timers because we want to be seeker sensitive and user friendly. But man's ways are not God's ways. God says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. But as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. And God saying, there's only one way to do it. It's the Bible way. And if you don't want to do it the Bible way, you might as well close the doors. But we always want to do it man's way, our way. We're smarter than God. God, we're going to really show you how to do it. No, we, we don't want to do it your way because we may offend somebody. You know, casting out devils is not very seeker sensitive. We have to be very sensitive to the uh, visitors in our church. And uh, what would they think if they saw somebody screaming? Now, who cares what they think? If you don't like it, leave. Because you're not seeking God anyway. When you're seeking God and you come into contact with the power of God, uh, even though you have never seen it, uh, if there's a hunger on the inside of you, the Bible says deep calleth unto deeper. Uh, and when you see the deep things of God, uh, there's something on the inside of you that says, I want it. We want to be seeker sensitive, user friendly. We're a user friendly church. 
we don't get too heavy. You know, we don't really preach a heavy sermon because we have visitors, new people who have moved into the community, but they little religious selves. And they come to church with they little, they little religious clothes on, got their little girl in a little white bonnet and a white dress with a white pant leather shoes on and a white purse. I'm not interested in getting some religious person in my church. You need to be saved like everybody else. Yes, yeah, so we're the Smiths, and we're, we're new in the community, and we're looking for a church. Come on in. We got deliverance tonight. Got just what you're looking for. The power of the Holy Ghost. We got just what the doctor ordered. Healing, deliverance, and miracles in the name of Jesus, uh, and we're not ashamed of it. Come on down. Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, we got just what the doctor ordered. The power of the Holy Ghost. Well, stand on your feet and give God some praise. Hallelujah. Come on and praise him. Hallelujah. Somebody said, somebody said it don't take all that, but God is saying it's going to take all of that and more. It's going to take all of the Holy Ghost, all of the power of God. It's going to take the name of Jesus. It's going to take casting out devils. It's going to take healing the sick and raising the dead and prophesying. God says you need it all. God's way. We're going to do it God's way. Not man's way, but God's way. Not our way, but the way of the Holy Ghost. The way of the Word of God. God, I want to do it your way. Not my will, but your will be done in Chicago. Glory. Oh, oh. God is going to use us to bring the harvest in. God's going to use us to reach the unreachable. God's going to use us to touch the untouchable. God's going to use us to break the city open. I don't care how much they fight, keep casting out devils. Keep praying. Keep breaking the powers of darkness. God says if you do it my way, you're going to see a harvest. You're going to reap. They're going to come from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. We're gathering them together in the name of Jesus. How many see it? How many see it in the Bible? This is not my word, it's God's word. It's not my way, it's God's way. I didn't write it, the Holy Ghost wrote it. It was here before you got here. It's going to be here after you're gone. It's the same Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord. I don't change. I'm the same God in the book of Acts, and I'm here right now to deliver you and set you free by my power. Hallelujah. I said glory. God's way is the best way. 
God's way is the only way. God's way is the right way. It's the word of God. It doesn't change. It'll work today. I don't care where you're at. In America, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in Russia. It'll work because it's the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word, it shall stand forever. Come on and give God some praise in this place. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, God is saying men might laugh at you. They might talk about you. They may not understand what you're doing. But God says, remember, I choose the foolish things to confound the wise. I choose the weak things to confound the mighty. But God says, don't draw back. God says, what I put in your hand is a key. The devil doesn't want you to use it. But God says, use it. It's the key to winning the lost. It's the key to building churches. It's the key to gathering in the harvest. It's not some little side room ministry. It's not some ministry off the side of the church. It's not some ministry behind closed doors. God says no. He said the ministry I've given you is not some side ministry that you have to hide off to the side and do behind closed doors. But God says the ministry I've given you is the key to reaching your world for Jesus Christ. For not only will you preach the gospel, you will demonstrate the gospel. You'll demonstrate the gospel. You'll preach deliverance to the captives. The Spirit of God is upon you because God has anointed you uh, to preach deliverance, uh, to preach deliverance, uh, to preach deliverance uh, to the drug addict, uh, to the alcoholic, uh, to the homosexual, uh, to the lesbian, uh, to the murderer, uh, to the gangbanger. I don't care who they are. Jesus said, preach deliverance uh, to the captives. Uh, hallelujah. Well, give God some praise. Come on, let's praise him in this place. Glory. Glory. Oh, Jesus. Oh. How many seeing something? How many seeing something you never saw before? God is opening his word up to us and showing us. We're saying, God, show us a better way. God is saying, the best way is my way. We're saying, God, we're tired of doing it man's way. We're tired of doing it the denominational way. We're tired of doing it the Baptist way or the Church of God in Christ way or the apostolic way or the evangelical way or the Catholic way. God is saying, if you're tired of doing it the religious way, God says, study my word and do it my way. For I've said unto you, the works that I do, you'll do also and greater works shall you do because of me in other words God is saying it's time to preach the Bible regardless of what religious folks think God says if you do it my way you're going to see blind eyes open up you're going to see deaf ears opened up you're going to see dumb tongues loop you're going to see the crippled walk you're going to see the blind dead raised you're going to see the dead raised up you're going to see people coming to Jesus Christ God says do it my way Oh yes, when you do it God's way, you'll get persecuted. Oh yes, you'll get talked about. Uh, they'll say the same thing that they said about Jesus. Uh, he said the servant uh, is not better than his master. If they said I cast out devils uh, by bells above, uh, they're going to say yeah, what you're doing uh, is of the devil too. Uh, so God say don't draw back uh, when preachers stand up uh, and fight your ministry. Don't draw back uh, when they stand up and say uh, that casting out devils uh, is not of God. Uh, it's of the devil. Uh, God said they said the same thing uh, about 
about my son Jesus. Uh, but the Lord said, uh, if you're not with me, uh, you're against me. Uh, and so God says, uh, make up your mind. Uh, either you're going to follow me uh, or you're going to follow man. Uh, if God be God, uh, then follow God. Uh, if Baal be God, uh, then follow Baal. Uh, God says, stop walking uh, in the middle. Uh, it's time to get all the way in uh, and cast out devils uh, and heal the sick uh, and prophesy and preach the gospel. Uh, God says, uh, come on over and get with me. How many going to get with Jesus? I don't know about you. I'm going to follow Jesus. I don't care what churches say. I don't care what denomination says. I don't care what the bishop says. I don't care what the superintendent says. I don't care what the pastor say. I don't care what the church mother or the state mother says. I don't care what the district elder says. I'm going to do what Jesus said do. He said if you do what I say do, you'll build your house rock uh, and when the winds come uh, and the floods come uh, when everybody else falls apart uh, God says you'll be standing because you built your house uh, on what I said uh, instead of what man says uh, God says we ought to obey him rather than man how many gonna obey God in this place oh Jesus hallelujah but put your hands together and praise the Lord one more time thank you Jesus Oh, glory. Glory. Oh, glory. Hallelujah.